Hello and welcome to Ready to Trade, investing in the UK's green industrial revolution. I'm Emma Crosby. As the world moves towards a post-pandemic chapter, we all face a unique chance to redefine and rebuild the world that we live in. Governments and businesses don't just want to build back better, they want and need to build back greener. Now, during this show, we're going to meet politicians and business leaders who are paving the way for a more sustainable future and an increase in green investments. But first, let's set the scene. Since the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015, the world's attention has been on the impact of climate change. In 2020, the effects of minimal travel resulted in people in northern India seeing the Himalayan mountain range for the first time in 30 years and residents of Venice have seen the bottom of its iconic canals for the first time ever. Society, businesses and investors want a clear sustainability strategy to underpin the economic recovery. In the UK, the government has committed to not just build back better, but to build back greener as the first major economy to pass a net zero emissions law with a target to bring greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050. Offshore wind, hydrogen and other forms of renewable energy will play a growing role in meeting the country's energy needs. There'll be a keener focus on clean transport, creating opportunities for battery makers, electric vehicle manufacturers and those operating across the EV charging value chain. A stable policy and regulatory framework in the UK will provide long-term direction and support innovation for investors, with an independent economic regulator for energy markets encouraging companies to innovate. As a leader in many sectors, aerospace, energy, creative, technology and financial services, and with a diverse and highly skilled pool of talent, there's an ambition to establish the UK as the global centre of green finance. The pursuit of green objectives will affect all these sectors and create a wealth of opportunity. The investment potential is clear. We find out more about the Department for International Trade's crucial role in taking sustainable and green opportunities to foreign investors while helping the UK government to build back greener. Well, building a greener future starts with solid support from the government. And here in the UK, the government has outlined key steps that will be part of the so-called green industrial revolution in its 10-point plan. I'm pleased now to be joined by Lord Grimstone of Boscobel, Minister for Investment for the Department for International Trade, to discuss the role that the Department for International Trade will play in building a cleaner society. Lord Grimstone, welcome to the programme. Tell me, what is the Office for Investment? We've set up this new office in Downing Street. Um, it reports to me. Um, it's very much the front door for our investment. Um, import, um, um, supporting our, our largest investors, um, looking after our largest investment projects. Um, it's a single door that um, investors can go to to get help. And what better single door to have in the United Kingdom than one that's got number 10 painted in large letters on the front of it. So give me an example then, Lord Grimstone. If, for example, a new renewable energy company wanted to build a plant in the UK, how would the Office for Investment help? Well, first of all, we would um, talk to them. Um, if it was a large investment, I'd obviously be involved myself. Um, we would find out what they, what they wanted. Um, it's easy just to say we want to invest, but of course we need to know what they're looking for, what kind of returns they're looking for. Um, we have a very good view of what the investment opportunities are throughout the UK. Um, we work very closely with our, our metro mayors who understand the local situation so well. Um, there's various um, funding supports available. Of course, we're experts on all of that. And what we will help an investor do is we will help tailor a package that's the exactly appropriate package for that, for that investor. Once they're here, um, another part of my responsibilities is to provide a sort of concierge service for them. So they always know that there's somebody in the UK government they can come and talk to who is helping remove barriers for them. So we think the combination of this, the, the Prime Minister's support, um, the Chancellor of the Exchequer's support, um, is absolutely what an overseas investor will need to make a success of investing in the UK. Lord Grimstone, thank you. Now, at the heart of sustainability is energy, how we produce it, store it, and of course, how we use it. 
Let's delve deeper now into the government's energy plans with our next guest. Rodney Barclay is Director for Energy and Infrastructure at the Department for International Trade. Rodney, it's a pleasure to have you on the programme. Why is the UK an attractive destination for clean growth investment? From my experience, there are three key underlying factors that drive investment. The first is around market opportunity. The second is very much around um, the ecosystem. And the third is around the wider visions and strategies um, of a government. When we're talking about um, market opportunity, so when I look to the UK, we recently, um, you know, we are the largest you know, offshore wind deployment country at the moment with some 40 gigawatts by 2030. We're looking to have some floating offshore wind, one gigawatt by the same time. We've just recently announced in terms of our hydrogen sort of light strategy that we will um, have five gigawatts of deployable energy by 20. 30, you know, these are all really big. And, you know, if we're going to have hydrogen, you've got to have carbon capture uses and storage, which is an absolutely new, nascent technology. And um, so that creates a market um, opportunity. So we have a, you know, a, a massive market there for companies to come and um, engage with. And this new technology, this positive change in energy is transforming so many sectors here in the UK. Do you think that the UK is now starting to have this image of a global leader in renewable energy and clean energy? And are other countries looking to us as a model to follow? We are the first country to sort of legislate for net zero till 2050. You know, we'll be hosting COP26 this year in, in November time. Um, you know, we've got the G7 presidency taking place and there will be a bit of a, a climate theme so there's an opportunity for us to show well, real world leadership in terms of what we do on the climate stage and what we do with regards to clean growth. You know, we're the world leader in offshore wind at the moment. So that's, that's a fabulous thing for us to be able to say. And, you know, we've got demonstrations going at the moment with regards to hydrogen and hydrogen in the, in the home place. You know, how do we bring in this new technology, this new fuel source into to the whole, you know, to our, to our daily lives and our ways of working. So absolutely, I think there is an opportunity for us to be um, a global leader and we want to be a global leader in this area. Rodney, thank you very much. Great insights there from a government perspective. Well, let's turn our attention now to corporate innovation within sustainability, because if we all want a greener future, we have to make sure the world's biggest businesses are on board. Let's speak now to Kelly Becker. She is president, UK and Ireland, at Schneider Electric, a company which has heavily invested in the UK. Hi there, Kelly. Now, the UK has a green investment plan and a plan to build back better. How does that tie in to what Schneider Electric is and what your company does? We're actually incredibly excited about the government's um, green plan and net zero presence because we think it has the opportunity to not only make the UK a leader on this front across the world, but in fact, it's directly closely related to what we do as a business. So Schneider was named the world's most sustainable company just a couple of weeks ago by Corporate Knights. And our presence in the UK is all about driving sustainability and green infrastructure. And so what the government's intent to do is directly aligned with our strategy and where we think the world actually needs to move in terms of moving towards net zero to combat climate change. Let's spend a bit of time talking about technology now because you've mentioned it plays an incredibly important part of your business. So what role does it play? It's at the forefront of where we're trying to go. As I had mentioned earlier, you know, 100 years ago, you would have looked at Schneider and said, oh, this is a pretty standard industrial corporation. 20 years ago, you might, in fact, have looked at us that way. Now, in the last 20 years, we've made huge investments, um, both internally and externally, both from an R&D perspective, as well as um, some of the acquisitions we've done to drive technology further into the business. The pandemic has actually even moved our digital presence forward. So if you think about a year ago, we moved hundreds of salespeople that operate in the UK uh, to work completely digitally. And these are individuals who uh, would have been in their car every day meeting customers along the way. And so um, the technology has enabled us, in fact, to keep the business running and moving and growing. 
Um, and, and technology is what's going to move us forward as well on the green and net zero front. Kelly, thank you very much. Some fantastic insights from Kelly Becker there. Well, as my next guest will explain, it's possible to transform a traditional industry at scale to become a more sustainable business thanks to advanced manufacturing techniques. Terry Van Lanker is the CEO of Axa Nobel, a company which has built one of the world's most sustainable paint factories in the north of England. And it's my pleasure to say he joins us now. Thierry, welcome. What makes the Ashington plant so sustainable? Well, when we did the investment in 2017, it was ended. It's a hundred million pounds investment. It's probably one of the most, it's the world's most advanced technological and sustainable plant. Now, there's a number of things that make the Ashington plant so different from a normal uh, paint plant, which tends to be very much batch operating, mixing and blending. It's a bit like a kitchen if you make, uh, if you make paint. Uh, the Ashington plant is really trying to make it into an end-to-end -end process. So it has the on-site renewables. We do have our uh, own photovoltaic and biomass boilers on the site. Uh, we have high-speed uh, dispensers that therefore use less energy. All in all, I would say if you add it up, it's about 15 to 20 percent less energy consumption than any of our other plants around the world. Uh, very agile so that we can make the exact batches. Paint has the nasty habit if you make it in a certain color, in a certain quantity, you can't sell it to anybody else if the customer takes less than what you actually have prepared. In addition, on the site there is uh, water um, uh, purification. Uh, we do do uh, rainwater harvesting for our products. Uh, and then the whole site has actually the, 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 the last technology on uh, elect electrical circuits that use the minimum LED lighting, etc., etc. So it was a newly designed plant from scratch that really has all of the best um, technologies to reduce energy consumption, use wastewater consumption, and just reduce waste in general. And why is sustainability so important? Well, Axel Nobel has three core values and one is sustainability. The, the little secret is that even if the management would want to change something, the organization wouldn't let us. So it's basically very much uh, from the ground up that sustainability is core. There's a number of, uh, of elements that are important for the company. First, it's the right thing to do, but you expect uh, people like me to say that in public, but we actually mean it. Secondly, in our, in our whole um, journey, in fact, of bringing products that have the lowest footprint and have the biggest advantages for the, uh, for the, the users, uh, we really go deep on making sure that they have the lowest footprint, um, that basically they, they, they really bring a value to, to our customers. Now, so that's important for who we are as a company. There is a business case. So in fact, being sustainable, it does not have to be a cost. All of our actions really have a business case that's associated with it. When people think about sustainable investing, things like wind turbines or electric cars come to mind. Apart from the colour, how can paints be green? Well, interestingly enough, uh, there's a, a big applications for us with our um, uh, performance coatings in electrical vehicles. And we are, in fact, the world leader on wind turbines, highly specialized products on the blades and on the, sh on the shafts of the, uh, of the wind turbines, specifically the move to offshore, which is more and more the case. But I would say for a paints and coating company like ourselves, there's actually three areas. Is one is how do we make the products, the footprint of uh, making the products. Secondly, what's in the can. And then three, what are the advantages that it brings to our customers. If you look at how we make it, the Ashington plant is a, is a textbook example worldwide on the low footprint, low energy consumption, renewable energy consumption, uh, low waste, uh, wastewater recycling, all the everything that actually goes together in that. So there we're front and center. Secondly, and by the way, resource productivity is not only good for the environment, it's mostly good for the wallet too, because you use less materials, you squander less for the same output, hence the business case that's behind it. Secondly, what's in the can, uh, we do go very far and we've been the first adopter on anything, even proactive, when it goes around products that might be a bit suspicious as there is increasing knowledge. We are the first ones to take those products out and replace them, which is much more acceptable. That's why we're front and center with bio-based resins in our products. That's why we're fr uh, front and center by taking products out that actually are more from renewable resources, etc. Uh, we also have uh, started as of last year our Dulux uh, Evolve. In fact, we launched it in the UK. It's a, it's a top range uh, paint that contains 30% recycled product. 
It's a very uh, state-of-the-art system to reclaim unused paint, to get it back up to par and then reuse it. So in fact, it's a, there's, it's a whole way of making sure that's what in the can is right. Thierry, thank you so much. Right, so we've had insights on green manufacturing. Now let's take a look at sustainable packaging solutions. We all like to click and pay online these days, but we also know that too much packaging can be detrimental to the environment. So as a result, the UK government has introduced regulations in a bid to develop smart packaging solutions. Here with me to discuss this opportunity for the UK to be a pace setter on sustainability is Charles Elumi. President and CEO of the packaging giant Hutamaki. Charles, welcome. How would you describe Hutamaki's current relationship with the UK? Hutamaki in the UK, it's a, it's a long story already. It's, it's been 50 years uh, for Hutamaki to be invested in, in operations and business in, in the UK. We have invested a lot through the, the decades. If I take the last five years as a reflection or an illustration, we have invested 68 million pounds of uh, organic investments and acquisitions in, in the UK, ending up today with a, a, a footprint where we, where we have uh, five manufacturing factories from the south coast to the northwest coast of England and as well uh, Northern Ireland. So we have a, a very a good um, implementation and, and, and we're very pleased to be in the UK. Tell us a little bit more about Hutamaki's approach to sustainability. What are your goals going forward? That belief is uh, that uh, the value of packaging for sustainability and for the environment is much higher than its impact on, on the environment. And, and what I mean with this is that um, packaging has lots of values to, to offer. First of all, it offers food availability. It offers goods availability everywhere in, in the world uh, across, across the market. So the second thing is it offers uh, hygiene and, and safety to, to consumers. You can't think of food safety without having uh, the right packaging. And then probably the most important in the context of your question on sustainability is the fact that packaging is the best way to prevent food waste. Today, food waste is the top offender from the food systems in terms of sustainability. The food waste, uh, the, the losses of food in the world, which is one third of the food produced is, is lost or wasted. Um, this food waste represents 8% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. So you understand that how to prevent, how to reduce the, the food waste is to have the right uh, packaging. And, and I'm such a strong believer of this and, and the entire company because very often we see in the society that there is a wrong assumption made on, on packaging. And you hear so often, and in the media actually as well, in the social media particularly, you hear that you know a world without packaging would be a good world. And that's, I have to say, it is so wrong. It's, it's just a wrong assumption, made on good feelings and good intention, but it's just wrong. Packaging is offering lots of different values, which are higher than its impact. And it's extremely important to understand that whether we want it or not, the population is growing in the world. The population, the society has more demand for more safety, for more convenience, for longer shelf life. And therefore, I think the debate should not be about having less packaging in the world, but having better packaging. That's, I think, the strong belief that we have as a company, how to drive better packaging. And, and that drives to thinking of um, better packaging being linked to better materials. That's the number one. So using more renewable materials. Um, driving innovation, innovation for recyclability, because of course we believe, and that's one you ask about what, our, what is our ambition or our goals. One of our uh, goals is that by 2030, 100% of our packaging will be designed for recyclability. And then it's about end of life uh, of the products, because at the end of the life of a packaging, then you need to take care of its collection and, and recycling. So these are the overarching goals that we have as, as a company. And what are the potential opportunities within the UK, with an eye, of course, on green investment and sustainability? 
Well, may, maybe we should uh, look at, at the UK first of all um, in 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 a way which should make the UK overall proud. Is uh, the UK represents one of those markets where many trends are being born and 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 being copied in other other markets or other countries in in the world, and and that's the opportunity for for the UK right now as we speak of the importance, the relevance of putting in place. A new legislation for sustainability. I think the UK, you know, without any qualification of whether Brexit is right or wrong, it is there. And, and now that uh, the UK is outside of the EU scope, I think the UK has a huge opportunity to drive a fast uh, legislation, but legislation which is pragmatic, not restrictive. If the UK wants to play a leadership role in that context, there is a huge opportunity and it's now. What is the potential for the UK in this new investment landscape, in your opinion? Well, I think that in order to drive really a systemic change uh, in, in sustainability, I think uh, two things represent a huge opportunity for, for the UK right now. Um, number one is to drive um, a legislation framework that would be enabling rather than restrictive. So enabling meaning uh, prompting the use of renewable materials, um, enabling, promoting uh, innovation, as well as um, uh, investing in infrastructures and, and education. That's, that's one set of um, an opportunity for, for, for the UK right now, the, the legislative agenda. Um, the second aspect, I think it would be to really drive and implement um, the conditions, the framework for circular economy, which has to do with um, putting in place infrastructure for protection of post-consumption packaging, but as well recycling. And if we do it well, um, I'm convinced that it can be economically sustainable, not only sustainable from an environment point of view, but as well from an economic point of view, which is, of course, essential if we want this to be a systemic and a change for the long term. Charles, thank you so much for joining us. Well, let's turn our focus now to a sector which has a significant impact on the environment, that being the travel industry, in particular air travel. Hydrogen is the energy buzzword at the moment and it's set to help make this sector carbon free. I'm pleased to say we're joined now by Val Mifkatov, CEO and founder of the green tech startup Zero Avia, who's hoping to transform the travel industry with its hydrogen electric aircrafts in the US and here in the UK. Val, tell me a little bit more about your company. What does that involve exactly? Yeah, so um, as you might have might see uh, in the background behind me, what we're looking for is uh, to build the new ecosystem around zero emission aviation. We think that hydrogen electric approach, where we use hydrogen as fuel on board the aircraft and then hydrogen fuel cells to produce electricity and then electric motors to drive the propulsors, whether it's a propeller or a fan on the larger uh, aircraft, that approach we think is the best uh, fundamentally. And we're looking to build this ecosystem of fuel production on site from local renewable sources and then refueling the planes that are equipped with our engines and deliver comparable uh, mission capability to the fossil fuel aircraft. So I think with time, we can replace substantially all uh, engine sizes. Um, and our roadmap starts with um, the 10 to 20 seat aircraft um, in about three years, uh, and then 50 to 80 seat aircraft uh, in another three years after that. And by 2030, we think we'll be able to um, uh, get a single aisle 100 seat uh, size jet up in the air and for um, a trip for a thousand kilometers or more. So those are your technical goals. What are your commercial goals? What is the magnitude of the opportunity here? So the overall market is one and a half trillion dollars, right? Aviation market. And um, the, the big reason for starting the company was realization that um, aviation is likely to be one of the largest problems we're going to have, uh, definitely in transportation, but possibly across all industries in um, getting to net zero and getting to a, a clean economy. And the reason is that you know, power requirements, energy requirements are just so large. If you think about 
all different segments of transportation, aviation is the worst uh, in that, right? So you have um, in modern aircraft like a 737 or A320 um, Airbus, uh, you have you, you can have 40% of the takeoff weight of uh, the vehicle in fuel, right? which means, and that's you know a very highly energy dense fuel like jet fuel. So clearly the energy requirements are extreme. And if you compare that with cars, for example, where just 2% of the weight is fuel typically, you see the, the magnitude of a difference, right? A 20X difference of a challenge. So some of the solutions that work in cars will not will never work in um, a serious segment of commercial aviation. So the total market is one and a half trillion dollars. Nobody has a solution today. The solutions will be forced onto the uh, onto the market uh, because by 2050, everybody wants to be at net zero. And if you just do the um, business as usual aviation, the emissions are gonna triple by that time. What has made the UK an attractive destination for your investments and for the work on this project? Early on, we uh, we did this once we decided what we want to do and what kind of technology we want to focus on and how we're going to develop it. We did this scan across the world um, of various government programs, um, sort of industry ecosystems, and we looked at, I think, four or five different geographies pretty closely of course us um, uh, and especially california where we uh, we started the company originally um, norway uh, uk uh, some in continental europe and we decided in the end to uh, to push on the uk uh, for a few reasons uh, one is that the ecosystem is quite concentrated in the UK aviation ecosystem. This is one of the uh, critical industries uh, for the United Kingdom. So there is a lot of support uh, of that from the government, but also there are a lot of companies um, in the space. So, you know, GKN, Megat, Rolls-Royce, Airbus has big facilities and, and everybody else around them. So, so it's really you know, disproportionate concentration uh, um, out of, you know, some of the other countries. Then uh, we like the fact that um, UK has uh, possibly the most sizable and concentrated program in um, aviation innovation or R&D support, the, uh, run by Aerospace uh, Technology Institute. Uh, so this is a good chunk of money that is allocated just to aviation R&D, um, which is quite unique. And we like the, uh, the, the process of uh, how that um, opportunity was structured, because there is no rigid sort of, hey, we're going to do a call once a year, once every three years, and then everybody piles on. It's a continuous intake, and they really look at, uh, you know, for the best ideas. So that worked really well with the agile nature of you know what a startup does a fast growing fast growing startup does in the industry like this so uh, a lot of those things and we we also wanted to um, uh, have very strong presence in europe you know it's it's wor it worked out for the company uh, really well so far val thank you very much that really does sound promising for the travel industry Right, well, we've been hearing from a variety of inspiring business leaders and innovators on how they're tackling sustainability in different ways. So let's round up the conversation by returning once more to Lord Grimstone. Lord Grimstone, welcome back. To summarise, Lord Grimstone, tell me why the UK is an attractive investment destination for overseas investors right now. I think because of the, because of the opportunities here, um, we're a, a country that is you know, very rich in innovation and R&D. People want to come here to take advantage of that. Um, we're very stable. Um, we're, we're, we're predictable. Um, we try to have, um, you know, we, we try to create environments that are very conducive to investment. But also I think one of the key things is, is that once you're in the UK as, in, as an investor, you're treated on absolutely all fours with Domestic investors, and um, we have no, we have no, we have nothing which stands in the way of overseas investors making a success of it here. And we have them here for generations. You know, people, people find the UK an easy place to to work in, an easy place to 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 live in. So it's all those factors pulled together. 
I think, which make the UK so attractive. And why the focus on sustainable investment? Why is that the right decision? We have fantastic R&D here. We have fantastic innovation. Um, and that has thrown up all sorts of investment opportunities for people to invest in sustainability. Um, investors love it because investors have learned that sustainable companies provide better returns they're, they're, they, they, they are, they, they're there for longer and, and they're doing good. And I think nowadays um, investors don't just look for commercial returns. They look for something that has these social objectives, has a broader base of, of, of objectives and sustainability scores very highly across all of that. Once again, Lord Grimstone, thank you for joining us. Well, that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. I'd like to thank all our fantastic guests for providing their broad range of insights into how we can build a greener, cleaner, more sustainable future whilst increasing business and investment opportunities. If you would like to find out more about this topic, then please visit cnbc.com forward slash ready to trade. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.